finally I can do. Uh, so let's start it with uh, uh, introduction. So as we all know that traditionally FBI can promote economic growth and development through both bolstering capital stock, uh, facilitating technology diffusion and uh, enabling the transfer of knowledge. So, however, the efficiency of FBI comes on various kinds of uh, factors, such as uh, human capital of the recipient country, uh, level of financial development, and other related variables shown in the literature. So, we find the conflicting evidence in terms of whether FBI can promote the economic convergence. So, uh, as you can see from the literature, um, uh, the, we, we find conflicting evidence and uh, based on the paper written by Nito and uh, Viga in 2013, we can see that this kind of conflicting evidence is mainly comes from the uh, empirical methodologies they, they used in the literature. So uh, in terms of the, please. Uh, just for clarification, you mean that some people find that even receiving FDI means that you don't catch up with the frontier uh, or what exactly do you mean? Convergence to whom? Convergence to the recipient, like the FDI recipient and the source country, the host countries. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They might find that some convergence or divergence. Okay. So this, this kind of a situation. It, uh, so it's like a pairwise kind of comparison we are interested in. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, as we all know that in solo model, it is a traditional and classic model to see whether a country, a poor country can catch up with the rich. Uh, so uh, as we may know that um, they, the, the theoretical part of solo model tells us that the two countries, in spite of their initial uh, economic situation, they catch up based on the uh, economic rules, et cetera. So um, if, if we, if, if sometimes that the increase the saving and the investment only gives some like trans, uh, transitory, uh, transitory effect. Huh? So in this study, we employed solar model, but with a recursive investment again, incorporating a previously overlooked factor, the bargaining power of the host country and its applications for growth and convergence. Right. How should we think about now what you're trying to set up? Because now we have, when I think about FDI, mm -hmm. there's Coca Cola, that's FDI. Mm -hmm. It comes in, its goal is more to capture the market and make money for us. Mm -hmm. There's Tesla. Tesla comes in and mm -hmm. there might be yes. you know, technology yeah. diffusion, better jobs, and so on. Yeah, right? that, that is a way of uh, FDI. So, 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 by the host country, the recipient country's bargaining power, and they're thinking about what is the quality of FDI it's trying to get, whether that FDI is something so, that causes growth or not? Yeah, in my theoretical model, so I have uh, two factors to decide on both sides. The first factor is the, uh, the investment quantity, how much can you invest in, a, in another country? And the second one is how you're gonna to allocate the sur surcharge created by the FDI. Okay, I will go to in details in the uh, theoretical model part. So this is our theoretical finding. Uh, we identify there is a threshold of bargaining power. So below which uh, the wealthy country, the North country, can shrink the income gap between the two nations. So that is to say, for a North country, a capital abundant country, you, the FDI goes from rich to a poor country. Okay. So if this country has a relatively higher bargaining power over the South country, it can cause the economic divergence between the two countries. That's because the rich country has a relatively higher bargaining power. Okay, so of course, if the North country has a lower bargaining power over the South country, it will cause the economic convergence. Okay, so this is the theoretical finding from this paper. So there's a three shoulder level of bargaining power. So we, argue that the conflicting evidence in the literature, whether the FDI can cause economic divergence or convergence is primarily because of the unfavorable profit repatriation. This is caused by the bargaining power between two countries. And we also uh, conducted uh, empirical work 
So we applied the JDD quota round data. It's a newly declassified trade data involving 37 countries' negotiations on the trade recessions. So we find that there is an essential three-shoulder level, similarly as the theoretical part, we find a three-shoulder that, so this empirical finding is from a host country's perspective. So for a host country, if the bargaining power is high, then it can promote the economic convergence between the poor country and the rich country when the poor country received the FDI from the rich. Okay, so this is from the perspective of the host countries. And of course, if, if the bargaining power is lower, then it will cause the economic divergence between the countries. Okay. So specifically, we find that higher host country bargaining power leads to economic convergence in terms of uh, aggregated GDP ratios, but not necessarily in GBT per, GBT per capita and the long-term economic growth. Okay, so this is the change of different, different dependent variables in, in the model. Yeah. So if you just go back one slide. So when you think about, so when I look in, you look into the data, so for instance, and you look at say, how are profit sharing or profit repatriation agreements between pairs of countries? What's the variance in the data? Uh, so this is the theoretical finding. So, uh, so uh, we use model without any data. For the empirical part, we use yeah. the trade negotiation data during this time. Mm -hmm. It is the old data. So, it's, and it's, what, what is the proxy for this uh, repatriation then? The, you mean the proxy for the bargaining power? Yeah, you could say so, for instance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, I will go to that in the details, like how I constructed the bargaining power dummy, the variable, mm -hmm. okay? So for the findings, any questions? Uh, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, kind of what I'm wondering is why do you opt for a solo framework rather than an endogenous growth framework? Because uh, solo is quite uh, quite outdated now, and uh, obviously FDI is going to affect like uh, innovation and research, which is like a big part of the you know big component of growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just uh, asking so, why so. What... so why do you go for a solo uh, framework instead of an endogenous growth uh, framework? Endogenous growth, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe my co-authors is <laughs> going on this. Yeah, I, I will check endogenous growth model. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't okay. have a perfect answer for that, but, but yeah, I, I, I will talk with them, okay? Okay. No worries. Mm, for the research, uh, for the empirical part, uh, yes, but uh, as the independent variable. Also, also exploring the indigenous model. As long as you put in FDI, mm -hmm. yeah, it's also in a way you can you can argue that mm -hmm. it is. Indoors. Yeah, but for the theoretical part, we are using the solo so model. Can... Yeah. So okay. So the contribution is that we underscore the importance of uh, bargaining power channel for two main reasons. The first one is that uh, is that the bargaining power, the bargaining models have uh, proven effective in shedding light on a wide range of issues. And our paper also uh, adds the existing literature that explores the circumstances under which uh, the uniform restrictions on FDI should can be justified. So, so this also. So here. As we can see that, uh, practically, so our uh, implication of this paper is that the poor country should uh, strengthen their uh, bargaining power over the rich countries. So rather than give a uniform FDI restriction. Okay, so it's more like uh, for a poor country, you need to give like, uh, you don't need to give the uniform FDI uh, policy, you need to uh, see how you're gonna to improve your bargaining power, and then thinking about how much FDI or whether the FDI should go into your country or not. So this is the contribution and the implication of this uh, policy implication of this paper. And of course, um, our paper also hold particular relevance in the current uh, uh, context, as we can see these kind of uh, these parties among countries and also. Uh, 
pave uh, our our pave uh, the, the the way for the global security issues, etc. How do you? What are like some of the things that you can do mm -hmm. to improve the bargaining position? <laughs> Where is the bargaining uh, power for a host country? Yeah, that yeah. is a good question. Um, this research didn't give anyways like how you gonna improve your bargaining power, but give the lights on. If you can improve your bargaining power somehow, it can give you more benefits, more supplies. But that's almost tautological, no? It's like saying if I can keep all the profits, I'm gonna do better off. Of course, you're going to do better off if you can keep all your profits, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, in terms of how you're gonna improve your bargaining power, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, that that is a good way to think, but I, I don't have a right answer now. Maybe one place it comes from is like you know your relative resource abundance mm -hmm. compared to the sending country, right? Like if I have nickel reserves. Because, wants. Yeah, because for the empirical part, we use the trade negotiation in the WTO as a proxy for the bargaining power. So for the theoretical model, we just use like a gamma to, to, to quantify the model. You are seeing the empirical part, but yeah, but how are you gonna practically improve the bargaining power? Yeah, I didn't think that deep at current stage. Mm -hmm. No, any questions? I think I think uh, we, we had the same question, but um, I think Akash is right that if we have resources that no other countries have, then mm -hmm. that will be the bargaining power. Mm -hmm. And then some countries do have some comparative advantage mm -hmm. in terms like if you think about Malaysia, I think one of the comparative advantage is like the labor can speak English more um, compared to other countries in yeah. the region. Mm -hmm. Yes, because but in this research, I only used the investment in total. I didn't quantify different types of uh, investment. I didn't think of that in the model and empirical part. I, I think just to motivate, like, mm -hmm. in some sense, that um, um, capital abundant countries may have some bargaining power for the, in that sense. Like, that might be a... Then I doubt whether I can use solo model, maybe change the entire model. Because for the more for the solo model part, I can only use I instead of stands for the investment. Mm -hmm. So I did. Did you include human capital? Sorry, what is human capital? Human capital. Human capital. Human capital. Did you include it in your model? Yeah, it's, it's like a bargaining Nash bargaining uh, model. So uh, you you were saying the theoretical part of of the model. Uh, so the model can consists of two countries. Huh? South country and the North country, and leading to increase the total output due to the damage, uh, diminishing returns. So this is two countries, and we have a start starting period and ending periods. For the starting period, both countries negotiate negotiate two things, as I illustrated before. The one is how much you invest in another country, and the second one is like how you're gonna go allocate the surplus created by the FDR. Okay, so. They discuss the two factors, and then at the end of the period, the following the uh, the discussed in the early age, and then distribute the supplies. Okay, so the cycle repeats in each subsequent period, following an asymmetric Nash bargaining solution. So the bargaining solution seeks to maximize the Nash product. Okay, so in order to figure out how much you're gonna invest in another country and how you're gonna distribute your supplies, we need to maximize the Nash product. The Nash product is, is determined by the marketing power of each party. Okay, so you will see what is uh, Nash product in the model. Okay, so this is the classic solo, solo group model. So as we all know that we have a YT for the production, P for the capital, A for the technology, LT, L for the labor. So this is a couple of Cryptoglass style uh, production function and the law of motion capital, the change of the capital equals to phi multiplied y t, phi is the second rate uh, minus the uh, delta k t, delta k t is the depletion rate, second uh, delta r. Huh? So this is a change of the capital. And uh, so as, as we may know that uh, for the uh, capital per effective labor, if we define as this, the capital KT divided by AT multiply LT. So we can find the, the 
steady state capital project level equals to this one, phi divided by n uh, is the pro, uh, population growth rate, uh, the knowledge growth rate, and the delta, delta is the depression rate to the power of one divided by one minus alpha. So this is the statistic for the uh, capital project effective lab, uh, level. Okay, so we introduced the foreign investment in the solar model. So as I mentioned earlier, so if the investment is just I, we didn't classify different types of, uh, of FDI. So the North country's output is KN minus I because of FDI and the South country plus I, okay. So the production of the plus becomes F at the, at the capital of KS plus I minus F production function at the KS, at the capital, previous capital. And the way uh, use she presents the, the shear transported back to the north because of the API. It's like the, the returns, okay. So this is our net product. Net product it depends on the bargaining power of each country. It also follow the uh, capital class style. So A1 is the production after the FDI. She, remember, she is a proportion of the surplus get transported back to the north. And this, this one is the change of the production after the FDI. Okay, so for the A2, the remaining of the surplus lives in the south country. Okay, so this is A1 and A2. We give the, each of them the marketing power. Gamma, uh, gamma is the marketing power of the south country. Then one minus gamma becomes the marketing power of the, oh sorry, gamma for the north country and one minus gamma for the south country. Okay. So these are the two factors we decide to maximize the uh, product, Nash product. So any question? Okay. So we do the first order condition with respect to she and with respect to I. If we uh, for the she for the she part, we, we can find this gamma multiply a two minus one minus gamma multiply a one. If we do the first order condition in terms of I, which simplifies to this one, the equation 11, and if we combine the nine and the 11, we can get this one, the equation 12, okay? So for the, to simplify equation 12, we get equation 13. So this one give us that uh, impl implication that so the marginal production of capital for South country, when the capital equals to KS plus I, I is a, the FDI, equals the marginal production of capital in North country, when the capital equals to KN, KN minus I, okay? So solving this equation, we can get the optimal investment. The optimal investment is like this one. And for omega, omega is AN multiply LN divided by AS multiply FS. So we now solve the optimal I, we need to solve for the optimal G, which is the proportion of the surplus transported back to the north. Okay, so for the Optimal surplus shear, we can see, we can get this equation. So delta is the surplus. And uh, this lambda means the loss, the loss of the North country, of the rich country, after it gave out the FBI, the loss of its production, right? This is the, their pre previous production minus the production when they have FDI to the south country. Okay, so from this equation, we can see that it is uh, increased, the plus increase with the bargaining power gamma, which is to say if the bargaining power of the north country is high, then it can get more plus. But why do you call it an optimal then? 
what is it what is optimality here for surplus for the next product i said it's optimal because the two after the reclusive uh, negotiations the two country want to get this next next product maximized this next product is the solution of the uh nash bargaining but isn't optimality is depend purely on because that's just now a distribution of surplus question right there's no that's so that's always going to be somebody gaining and somebody losing what does optimality there imply i could see optimality is when investment marginal rate of return on investment in as south and the north get equalized that's my that's when you maximize your efficiency of investment right uh, yes that and is then what is this why is it what is this equation exactly yeah. and what is that doing then for what is what kind of optimality is it helping me achieve so uh, from here this okay. is the theoretical framework so the two countries are negotiating recursively right the two countries and they for the for the nash solution they want to maximize the, this one so yeah they need to maximize this one that is the next solution after negotiation between the parties yeah if you find from this literature this literature you will see okay if the two countries following an asymmetric national bargaining the the next solution would be the would be this depends on the bargaining power in each countries. Is that next thing? Yeah, maybe we can talk about it because I'm still can yeah, I'm I, yeah, I'm just assume I'm not understanding optimal to achieve what? Uh they will achieve the maximize of the Nash product. And this Nash product is the optimal solution for our bargaining power game. Okay. Okay. So now we get the optimal investment. That is to say, after the Nash bargaining uh, gain, what what amount of FDI from the uh, the north to the south? This is the I, and we have the shape. That is that after the discussion, what is the proportion of the supplies transported back to the uh, the the north? So, so is that the is value that. of she that ensures that you re attain I star? No, this is a proportion, the optimal proportion. They this after discussion how much the supplies will be transported back to the north. So, for example, if I'm not the north country, you are the south country. In the Nash equilibrium game, we discuss two factors. The first factor is how much I invest in you. And the second factor is after you get more production, how, how much you give the back to me? Yeah, but the second question, all I'm saying is just a pure retran it's a pure distribution question, right? Mm -hmm. There is no question of optimality there, is what I'm trying to understand. The more I give to you, the less I have. There's no way to make both people better off. Whereas I star is optimal in the sense that it maximizes the marginal productivity of capital, globally speaking. Okay, well, I'll, I will continue and we can discuss them. Yeah. Okay. So the, 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 the conclusion is that uh, if you have a higher bargaining power, uh, then you have a more promotion, more promotion of the class mm -hmm. transported back to the north. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, we can say that it, it is decreasing in supplies, which means if you have uh, more supplies, then you have a less proportion of the supplies transported back to the North country. Okay, so we also find that the, sh the sheep increases with the uh, dam, which means the output loss of the North due to the capital flow, which means like if you have a more loss because of the FDI to the South country, then the North country deserve more proportion of the supplies back. And how is my outside option defined in this Nash bargaining game? Outside situation. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm get engaging in a bargaining, right? I should have some kind of threat point. Mm -hmm. I would say, hey, if you don't want my investment, doesn't matter. I take it to Akash's country or I take it to Pauline. So there has to be some kind of thing that determines this bargaining process, right? How I 
we converge so in a typical Nash game, there's a threat point, right? When I walk away, we are left with a status quo outcome function, mm -hmm. right? How is that defined in this setting? So first it is in our model, we only have two countries. Yeah, but yeah, as you mentioned, we could probably could threat or whatever, but definitely not include other the third country. So only two countries. And it is repeated games. So as I mentioned, it thinks it is a repeated game. The, the solution, the optimal solution is that the two countries want to reach the next product and the next pro product can be written as the equation I showed above. I'm not an expert on the, uh, you know, game theory, but- So there is no possibility to opt out of the bargaining. It has to be like- There's no possibility for one party to pull out. Uh, this is a re repeated again, so I don't think there's a pull out of pull out. Yeah, it should be like the two players follow the repeated again and reach the uh, Nash favorite. I think in your model, the two countries only the whole world. We only consider two countries. Only, yeah, they create the same way. So there's a representative, the language model, there's a representative form, there's a representative consumer, it's a solar model. Mm -hmm. right? So there's only one type of SPI and one type of processing and configuration. And you also an option because it's only two countries, you're also an option always to not trade. Mm -hmm. But at least there's only two countries. If you take a uh, feature game, then you should trade. Mm -hmm. Even if it's only two countries, you have participation constraint, right? Mm -hmm. You can do not, like, like countries can choose not to do the FDI. So what is the participation constraints and in, in incentive? I think, think, I think for this model, the assumption is, uh, ah, is easy. The assumption, that, is yeah, the assumption is easy that the two countries involved in trade and they don't pull out of from FDI from any negotiations. It's like repeated again. I think that is the setup and the assumption of this model. Yeah, but you are right. I think so consider firm. You can see a different situation that maybe a country doesn't want to involve in the global context. Yeah. I think you need to state the assumptions. It's the assumptions mm -hmm. that fuse possibility on asking questions outside of the yeah. Yeah, we need to build on maybe the, the assumption of this model. Okay, so any questions? Can I continue? Okay, so this is a simplified sheet, the optimal sheet. And again, we can see that it is strictly increasing with the gamma, with the bargaining power, which means like if you have a more bargaining power, you will have a more surplus, the, the proportion of surplus back to the FDI given country increased. <clears throat> so now let's uh, calculate the 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 the, uh, the surplus, the delta time, the surplus. So if we go with the uh, capital accumulation equation as shown here, right? We see that F equals to the F, the production function of the north country, when the capital equals to K multiply I plus the proportion it gets from the FDI. And for the South country, this is the remaining of the surplus plus the, uh, the production function with its, uh, with its capital, okay? So effective unit equation can be written as this one, similar as the uh, classic simple solo model. Okay, so at the statistic, state that is like we put these two per effective capital equals to zero and we can get these two equations so the phi for each country equals to n plus g plus delta divided by phi so that is the same as the solo model part and for i we can write like this one okay so when we from the two statistic conditions, we obtain this. So that is to say for our paper, we can calculate the plus 
Okay. And this class also depends on the bargaining power of the two countries because the she is a function of uh, gamma, the bargaining power. Okay, so now we solve the I optimal I, the optimal she that two countries are discussed in repeated games. And we also calculate the delta, the surplus. Uh, now let's go back to the previous question, like whether the FDI can promote the economic convergence or divergence. So that's why we need to go back for the simple solo model part, as we can see that this is the optimal solution at a statistic. So Ki equals to phi i to the power of y minus y over alpha minus one. And with the intensive form, we can write it as this one, right? So y i equals to Ki to the power of alpha. That's why we can see the relative income gap between the two countries can be written as this. Right? If we plug this back to this, we can get this one. So this is the relative income gap, gap in the classic solo model without any investment or something. And for our Nash equilibrium, if you recall that in the previous slides we have here, we have the aggregated production of two countries. And if you can recall, we have the omega equals to AN multiplied LN divided by AS multiply LS. So if we write it as a small letter, means production for effective labor, it can be right as this one, multiply omega over one over omega, because we need to divide it Y, the capital Y by A, T, L, T. So this is the equation we get from the previous equations. Uh, so the so we argue that there must be greater or equal to W bar. So W bar is the solution of relative income gap when the two countries follow the the the, the normal uh, ways of uh, growth without any investment or FDI. So. If this number is greater than uh, W bar, then we can write as this, right? To ensure that this one must be equal or greater to W bar to ensure the relative gap does not shrink, right? Because otherwise this one will cause the widening between the two countries. So to put it simple, W bar here is the scenario when the two countries do not involve in any investment. And here, this is uh, after the investment, the Nash solution. So the Nash solution, if it is greater than the normal one, which means like uh, this during, for under these circumstances, so it caused the uh, economic divergence between the two countries. So that's why we can find a threshold of the bargaining power because previously in this one, we only have a she. But as I mentioned, she is a function of a gamma. So that's why we can write a gamma equals to the threshold of this equation. So if the bargaining power is higher than this, this is the weight, the bargaining power weight for the North country, right? So if the bargaining power of the North country is higher than this, that is to say it will cause the economic divergence because it is greater, the income, the relative income is greater than W bar when the normal solo solution for the income gap. So this is the theoretical findings. The most important one for, uh, for our research, we, 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 we find a lemma that there exists a threshold level of bargaining power such that if the North power is at least as high as gamma half, the relative income gap between the two countries will not fit. So this is the theoretical finding. Okay. 
Okay, then I have no questions. I will go to the empirical part. The empirical part is simple. Uh, this is the model. Uh, we have the GBT stands for the GB of source country and recipient country. Uh, we include FDI. We include the power and their interaction terms. We put different uh, fixed effect and also some controls at different levels. Okay, so I will put attention on this how we construct the power dynamic variable. Okay. Uh, yeah, FE stands for different uh, country year, four year level fixed effects. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have different uh, country variables such as the population growth rate, uh, distance between capitals, countries, and whether two countries are contiguous or not, having historical or sibling relations. We also uh, include the UN diplomatic disagreement score between two countries and the different types of uh, RTA. But all these are just going to fall out once you have fixed effects, right? Any kind of time invariant controls, you just don't need them, no? No, this one is a country time fixed effect, right? This yeah. is the source country, this is the recipient country. But for my uh, control variables, this is on IJT level. It is a country pair time control variables. For example, this one, the diplomatic discriminant score. They are variant over time. Over time, that's why it can be controlled. Uh, also for the population growth rate, this kind of IJT level. Yeah, but the distance between capitals, two countries share a uh, yeah. borders, are historical or sibling relationships. Yeah, that is IJ level control variables. I didn't put uh, IJ level uh, fixed effect because otherwise the power will be omitted because the power is on IJ level. So if I put a fixed effect on, on IJ level, then this one will be omitted. Does that make sense? So your, your model assumes that there's two countries mm -hmm. and that, that works because you know, there's only one C and there's only one uh, mm -hmm. delta and there's only one FDI control that's affecting the ratio of the piece. But in reality, in this equation, yeah, there is FDI I. between every pair of I and J. <laughs> that's in turn affecting investment as well as GDP. Yes. So when you're looking at convergence between like pairwise convergence countries. So how should we think of that? Because you know, the model is estimating one thing. This is estimating. Yeah. So the, the, the better way is like for our model, it, it, it we'll see if it can be changed into maybe multilateral negotiations. Yeah. Or, yeah. or you need to model like, you know, every single pairwise side. Yeah. That will be hard for the empirical yeah. part. Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's a good, yeah, it's a good suggestion. Yeah. So any other questions for the model? Okay. So this is our hypothesis. The first one is beta one should be smaller than zero, which means if if the power equals to zero, the power here is our sigma in the theoretical model, which means like if the north country the rich country does not doesn't have any bargaining power, then the power becomes zero. Okay, so if the if if the north country, the rich country does not have any bargaining power over the south country, then the FDI effect on the relative GDP ratio will become negative, which means it will create the economic convergence. That makes sense. But that is, that is only under the situation that power equals to zero, which means gamma equals to zero, which means the South country doesn't have any bargaining power over the North country. Oh, sorry, the North country doesn't have any bargaining power over the South country. If the North country has bargaining power over the South country, then the power dummy becomes one. Okay, becomes one. Then the FDI on the relative uh, economic gap will become beta one plus beta three. 
So we argue that if the if the north con if the uh, south country has the bargaining power over the north, uh, sorry, the north country has the bargaining power over the south country, then it will cause the economic divergence. That's why beta three has to be positive. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, this is how, how we construct the bargaining power. Uh, as you can see that the bargaining power has well made by um, multinational enterprises, household and workers institutions, like the, the uh, uh, European Council and then at the level of indifer, uh, individual firms in management study. So it's pretty hard for us to find a country to care bargaining power how we can quantify using different data uh, to our best knowledge. So uh, in terms of quantifying the bargaining power in country pairs, we only find this paper that well at 2021. 20, they use the newly declassified bargaining records on the quota run trade negotiation on tariff reduction. Okay, so they find the asymmetric bargaining position across bilaterals. Even though the WTO, it is a uh, Lateral organization, then we argue that the country peers they approach the request of a discussion on the product level. Okay, it is a multilateral organization, but uh, country peers are negotiation about the uh, the the tariff recessions separately. That's why Bagwell they use the gravity style regression to see how the bargaining power. Bargaining activities correlates with the GDP and distance. The gravity model tells that the, uh, the trend between the two countries can be decided by the GDP and the distance between the two cities. And the better way of use that to explain the bargaining activities instead of uh, uh, trade volume. Okay, so for the bargaining activities, we have three different ways of uh, bargaining activities. The first one is making request. The south, the, the, the south country can request the, the north country to give them a recession, tariff recession. And the north country can offer the concessions to the south country. And the south country then decide whether to accept the, the offer or not. So we have the final agree to tariff. Session. So three ways of uh, uh, bargaining activities. So we propose that the variation is the number of products, the dependent variable is the number of products on which there is a bad bilateral bargaining activities on three, three ways, like requesting, offering, agreeing to tariff concessions. After controlling for the GPT, the distance, which can be used for the proxy for the bargaining power between countries. Please. And I'm just slightly confused now because somehow when I think about tariff concessions, I'm thinking of them slightly direct, not necessarily directly related to FDI. In fact, to go the opposite way, it's like saying, you know, when I get, I don't know, something produced, cashew nuts produced from India into the United States, the U.S. says I don't impose any tariffs on them. Mm -hmm. Right? This has nothing to do with FDI. In fact, you could imagine there's almost... There are two plausible ways of thinking. When I have greater bargaining power on tariffs, I have greater bargaining power on my how FDI surplus is going to be negotiated. Or you could imagine that I give greater concessions on tariffs because then I give less concessions on how surplus on FDI is going to be targeted. So how do I how do I know that what you're measuring is how do we think about this power? This is you know that's nothing directly connected to FDI surplus sharing power at all, right? We argue that if I request uh, more tariff concessions, then to some degree it means that I have uh, more bargaining power than you. After explaining by the GDP between our two countries uh, or, or distance. But that's what I'm saying, right? I could, that could be exactly, I could give you more concessions because I say, hey, on, on the products you're import, exporting from your country to my country, Okay, it's great. I give you greater tariff concessions, but in return, when I send in my FDI to your country, the surpluses that I'm going to generate, I want a greater share back of it. 
Mm. I'm just. I'm not saying that necessarily must be the case. I'm just saying theoretically seems very possible, mm. right? And well, one thing I need to confess is that for these bargaining activities, it happens in 1950s for the quarter run. So maybe your situation won't exist because that is a bargaining power in the past. And the FDI happens in later in later years. And which is also a shortcoming for this paper because someone may argue that this bargaining power changes over time. But why you use the like the, the 1950s data? But uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the literature, it's pretty hard to find the bilateral bargaining power and proxies for that. So, yeah. Any questions or suggestions on this? So it's not possible for you to construct like the one with sort of more recent data? No, because even for the quarter round, it is newly classified. So do you have like, um, okay, uh, and maybe it would be nice to see like, how did these bargaining power proxies you get? I would like to see them for country pairs. Who has, so let's say, show me for the United States with a set of, uh, let's say, a set of 20 countries picked at random, right? What is the bargaining power? Do they, do they tally with sources we think should give some countries more bargaining power than the others? Because in fact, I would think that United States ends up giving greater concessions to countries which are poorer, weaker, in theory might have less bargaining power per se, and they want them to kind of, but are not threat countries for them in any sense. Yeah, I think I need to plot this kind of activities to make sure that it makes sense, right? Even mm -hmm. for the current situation. Not like a sanity yeah. check. Yeah, that, that is good. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Okay, so the more residual products, uh, that country I request country J to have a tariff concession, or the country J offers the concession on. The more residuals of these activities, the stronger the relative power of the north or the south. We use the residual because we, we want to cast out the effects of of the GDP and the distance, those normally use the gravity style determinants on bargaining activities. So the rationale behind using the procedure it captures the variation, variation in bilateral bargaining activities that cannot be explained by those gravity style uh, determinants. And uh, we argue that this kind of uh, prophecy is like how we do for the total vector productivity. So that, that is a residual after the production function, and then it is, it is a way of measure efficiency or technological progress. So, okay, so this is how we construct the dummy variable. It takes value of one if the residual is greater than the median. Okay, so R, we constructed three variables, three dummies. So R1, O1, A1. So R means request. O means offer, and A means uh, finally accept. If you're using the residuals, what is the rationale behind using a dummy variable as opposed to the continuous? Okay, so we use, uh, we also try, uh, we also try the standardized residuals as a dummy, but uh, uh, some, but our, but a referee, I think, our, our referee, I think, or, or we heard from a comment in a conference that we, uh, this, they believe that the gamma is supposed to be dummy to match with our theoretical model. The theoretical model of gamma is it is between zero and one, right? Is, is bargaining power. Yeah, it is a bargaining power. So bargaining power is absolute either zero or one. Yeah, it, it can be between and it never between. Yeah, so that's why. Yeah. Except, except for the dummy variables, we can use the standardized uh, procedures as a uh, bargaining power proxy. So you're saying you're taking the residuals and restricting them to zero and one. 
Yeah, so when it was directed. But zero one and one is like a range. And what you are really trying to say is this this binary dummy variable zero and one is actually a latent bargaining variable. Uh, my point is that we can use a standardized residuals, of course. Uh, maybe as a robustness check. I think we got the re result, but I didn't report it here. Uh, we reported only the dummies because we believe that if uh, it is above the three shoulder, then it means like you have a bargaining power over the South country. So it's like uh, decide whether you have the power or not. The variation will become less. Yeah, but yeah, I think it, it, it would be better if we also mm -hmm. report the, the yeah, standardized procedure. You can tell me it's easier to really say the all is it makes your analysis stable. Continuous also can also be used. Yeah. 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 Can also yeah. Be used. I can just continue that as well. But for this dummy, it means like whether you have the power or not. Yeah. The yeah, median is now randomly chosen by you, right? I could say should be the 75th percentile, should be the 90th percentile, should be the 10th percentile. There's just no inherent theoretical logic behind it, right? And so, so what defines the threshold now is your choice of it. And I've actually saying, well, cleaner would be to see what is, happens when you just, when you have all this data, which is continuous, why are you throwing away the information or cutting it at different points? Maybe it's not, it doesn't give you the right result. We're just trying to understand what's the rational behind not using it in a continuous function, but choosing below and above median, right? Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. Okay, so uh, we also have uh, three dummies accordingly based on the name of those standardized procedures. Okay, so as a robustness check, and yeah, and also yeah, I, I, will, I think we have the the the, the result of using the continuous variable using the standardized procedures and give us the similar results, but we drop it because of a comment. I forgot the reason why they pick for the the discrete uh, dummy variable. I think you have about five minutes. But, okay, yeah. yeah. So we also try with the percentage. So so it is a ratio of the number of concession on the final agreement divided by the initial request as a proxy for the bargaining power. Of course, the higher percentage means the higher bargaining power over the South country because your proposal, your request has been uh, has been uh, accepted by the South country. So similarly, we constructed the power AR. So this is the ratio. And this is the summary statistics, statistics of all the variables used in this uh, research. And uh, we saw some jobs here because we have uh, zero requests. Okay, so if we calculate the percentage, then when we have the zero as a determinant, it will lose some observations for sure. Okay, so this is OLS result. As you can see that we find the uh, negative data one or, or negative except for this one when we're using the, the ratio. But as I said, we lost a lot of observation here when we calculate the ratios. So we have find, we find the positive interaction term, right? So this all as hypothesized. So again, I will repeat the, the, the findings here. Like if the power equals to zero, which means like the North country does not have any bargaining power over the South, then it will cause the economic divergence indicated by the negativeness number. And if it has bargaining power, then it becomes positive. Because if the power here is one, then the FDI on um, uh, the economic uh, gap would become positive, which means economic divergence. And we also try with the IV, but uh, you know, but it's pretty hard as as we may know that to find a good instrument for and, and if you just go back first one second how should i interpret power power is is like the gap. no 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 i'm asking the coefficient on it right 
it seems to, it says suggests that when north has power mm -hmm. right it drastically reduces the gdps between the two countries yes that by is a factor of 5 so why is that would you imagine why what how should i what's what should be the relation between power and gdp ratios of countries is what i'm trying to ask you and the gdp ratio so you mean that this number is high right the coefficient the magnitudes of this coefficient is high a very high and negative, right? It seems to suggest if the U.S. has great power over Kenya, Kenya is going to very quickly catch up with the United States. Mm. If we take the partial derivative in terms of power, it becomes this one, multiplied FTI. Imagine that di is zero. Okay, so for a situation without any... I mean, you could add them up also, right? The, the coefficient is just so big on it, you know, you can see that. Now, I'm just trying to understand. I'm just asking you, what is the intuition behind? What would you think theoretically should happen between a country exercising more bargaining power and gaps between countries? You know, you made a theory about how it affects FDI. I'm just trying to understand on its own. Yeah. This one on the left hand side, you just have pairwise GDP ratio. Yeah. It just means that it's a correlation. So it's just saying that where the US has more power, it has it, it has smaller gaps between the countries. Those are the richer countries. The US has more power with richer countries. That's probably because in the data you have more direct negotiations between Europe and EU. Then Europe and okay. mm -hmm. that makes sense at least. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a cross sectional correlation. Yeah. That's really what it's saying. Not that if you increase power, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then observation as long as that is lower. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, as I mentioned that for, for this power we use the percentage, the final upgrade tariff concession divided by the total requests. Because we have a zero request for some scenarios. Okay, so for the two stage least square, I following GAL 2004, we use different fixed effects to predict FDI as the ID for FDI. Yeah, it is not that accurate, but it's pretty hard to find a good instrument for FDI. So after controlling for this, for this. Uh, FDI, this is the result we got from the two stage least square. So the result is pretty much similar as before. And we also conducted several robustness check. Here we uh, change the dummy from the previously we used the median as a cutoff. Now we change it to the mean value. And the result gives a pretty much similar result. And we also change the dependent variable into the GDP per capita ratio. Previously, in the previously we used the aggregated GDP. Here we use the GDP per, per capita ratio. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find the significant negative coefficient on FDI, but we do find the positive coefficient on the interaction term. So, which means if for a country, if the South country, has a negotiation power on the north one, then the FDI would cause the economic divergence between the two countries. Uh, and the, the result is pretty much similar when we change the depend dependent variable into the economic five years rowing economic growth. Okay, so finally, conclusions. The theoretically, we established the existence of a critical threshold for bargaining strength. So below the, the, the threshold, the income gap would be would, would, would shrink, even in the presence of the IPI flows. And empirically, from the perspective of the host countries, we find that if the host country has a higher bargaining power, then then would cause the convergence in terms of the overall GDP. However, this convergence does not extend to the GDP per capita ratio or the long-term growth rate. So conversely, when the host country has a weaker bargaining power, it tends to drive the economic divergence across all three measures. So this is a terrible finding.
Okay, I think that is all for the presentation. And, uh, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, this is my email. If you see any potential in collaborating in the future, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you.